Are you aware there are over 300 accounts from around the world concerning a global flood found outside of the Bible? Did you know the oldest known account of the flood dates back to 1700 BC? That's hundreds of years before the book of Genesis was even written. Before the flood, the Bible describes giants in the land was the direct result of fallen angels having offspring with human women as found in Genesis chapter 6. Sound outlandish? How do we justify thousands of excavations of skeletons ranging in height from 10 to 30 feet? Or can you explain the pinpoint meticulous details of megalithic structures such as Stonehenge, the pyramids, the Aztec calendar, or the ancient structures found in the Peruvian highlands? Join us now as we investigate this and so much more concerning the symmetry between the flood and the blood of Jesus. I am Mark Russick and you are listening to The Russick Outlook. As always, just my opinion. Good evening. Hi, my name is Mark Russick. You're listening to the Russick Outlook. Thanks for joining us tonight. Thanks for hopping on board. Uh, today, we're going to be opening up a brand new topic that uh, I, I believe I'm going to be covering several different broadcasts on. Oh, I know I will because it's it's just such a deep and vast subject. Uh, it's it's about the Genesis six flood and the Nephilim giants and what I have titled, It's About His Bloodline. Uh, part of the reason that I wanted to get into this was twofold. One, uh, I think by and large, my sense is the general population thinks that the the, the flood of Noah is, is a nice story. It's a narrative. It's You can learn some lessons from it. It's taught in Sunday school. They've seen some images around some cartoonish type images, but they don't really think that really happened. Uh, so I'm going to show a little bit about that. I'm not going to dig too deep into um, the the history, historical accounts, I should say, or the geographical and archaeological evidence of the flood, and there's certainly plenty of it. I will get into that sometime down the road, but that's not where I really want to concentrate on. I, I, I want to get into why the flood. Why did the Lord... In other words, if we look at it, you're going to see that the Lord was so angry that he was ready to destroy mankind. He was ready to destroy everything. Fortunately for us, uh, he found a, a, a just and rightful servant in, in Noah uh, who was perfect in, in, his, in his ways. Now, now, he wasn't a perfect human being. I'm getting a little bit ahead of myself, but you'll see uh, his bloodline was not tainted is, is what I mean by that. And that's what scripture means by that. So I want to, I want to get into some of the, the uh, evidence that we can look that the flood actually happened, but more importantly, uh, what was going on that, that made the Lord so angry that caused this flood to happen. And again, for me personally, uh, you know, I, I've, presented and I've tested the Word of God in, in a sense of testing against, you know, what does historical evidence bring? What does uh, some of the eyewitness accounts bring? I'm always about getting to the truth, looking at two sides, and, and time and time and time and time again. I find that the Word of God is true no matter, you know, what people will try to do or try to twist or slant or, you know, and, and there's been plenty of accounts where you know, there's been avowed atheists, high-level intellectual investigative journalists, lawyers, scientists who 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 went about the you know disp- their their intent was to disprove the validity of of, of scripture, the validity of Jesus Christ, uh, because they thought you know it was nonsense. But in the end, because they looked at the evidence objectively, they came to the conclusions that. Uh, that Jesus is Lord, that his word is true. And some of these people, you know, the, these avowed atheists who turn the corner are, are now, uh, you know, just, they have wonderful ministries. Uh, you know, they're out there preaching the gospel. Uh, you know, certainly not what they thought would happen. But, you know, I digress. But my point is, I really wanted to get into uh, some of the things that, that we can look at uh, in terms of the flood. I'm going to present some things that, I, I think some of the images that, that you'll see uh, if you're following this on video, and I'll describe it to you on podcast for the podcast listeners, and some of the things I'll mention uh, to the podcast listeners, they'll be familiar with. Uh, but I don't think they've looked at it, or I know a lot of people have not looked at it in the sense of 
uh, in the light of the flood and, and how that actually came about. So, you know, that that's my hope. Listen, uh, you know, if you enjoy subjects like this, please hit the likes button or the subscribe button, subscribe to the channel, the YouTube channel. Uh, or any of the social media platforms that we're on, on Facebook and Instagram, and and, and uh, we're on all the different podcast platforms. Wherever you're listening, wherever you're watching, thank you, thank you, thank you. But if you could hit that like or subscribe button, it helps us get the information out there. Because ultimately, as I say, you know, time and again, I'm about the truth, I, and I hope that the people that are listening are about searching for the truth and and you know, and, and engaging your mind and, and not just taking everything at face value that you're told. You know, let's let's uncover some of this and let's look at it from a couple of different angles. So that's that's always my 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 way of approaching things. So again, thank you for being here. Uh, on that note, so I'm going to get into it. We're going to talk about, this is going to be an introduction into the flood, into what's called the Nephilim giants. And you'll, you'll know in a few minutes if you what that means if you've not heard that expression before. So first, I wanted to get into the Ark itself. Um, the you know, and again, I, I if you're following me on video, I'm, I'm showing this little cartoon image of of a boat and, and you know, swinging in the waves with all these different animals and a giraffe sticking out of the roof and birds and elephants and lions and blah blah blah. Uh, and and I think it's almost been downplayed to the point where, you know it. Again, I think people, uh, you know, to say, "Oh, well, that's nice." The the flip side of it is, I, I'm presenting an image of a ministry in Kentucky. Some people may be familiar with it. It's called Answers in Genesis. Uh, it's about the Creation Museum. But anyway, Ken Ham, just incredible, incredible ministry. They built the ark according to the biblical specifications of what Genesis laid out. Uh, so they went into great detail, and if you're watching this on video, you see this beautiful vessel. It's actually, according to Genesis, the, uh, if you break it down, uh, it's 510 feet long by 85 feet wide and 51 feet high, over five stories high, 85 feet wide, and then 510 feet long. So it's a tremendous, tremendous vessel. Uh, so I'm going to... Uh, show you where where these dimensions are the, because you know the Lord was very 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 specific and detailed as he always is so I'm reading Genesis 6 uh, verse 14 uh, make yourself an ark of gopher wood make rooms in the ark and cover it inside and out with a pitch this is how you are to make it the length of the ark is 300 cubits its breadth 50 cubits and its height 50, 30 cubits. So when you break down the cubits into modern day measurements for me, for, for feet in, in North America, in America, that's how we, w we would break it down. Again, 510 feet long by 85 feet wide by 51 feet high. And it's got all of these different rooms and there's a lot of more detail to it. Um, if you are following me on video in the upper right corner, I show you how they broke down the inside of the ark. There's several stories and there's rooms and there's, when I say rooms, I mean, I, I should say, you know, div divisions of where you would keep the different animals. And you did have the eight people uh, um, who, who, who stayed in, in the ark. So at the bottom uh, in verse 22, I just wanted to highlight here that Noah did this. In other words, Noah did as the Lord instructed him to. He did all that God commanded him to. So he took the Lord uh, at face value and 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 created this vessel, built this vessel, and uh, put it out and in, in order to survive the flood. So I wanted to just point out to you a couple of things, and I'm not going to spend a lot of time on the veracity of of, of the ark actually being. Uh, something that's a stable vessel, but I did want to point out another atheist uh, who studied this. It's a scientific study that endorses the seaworthiness of Noah's Ark. The proportions of the Ark were found to be carefully balanced, ba um, car to carefully balance the conflicting demands of stability, comfort, and strength. This came from uh, a, a gentleman named Dr. Sian Hong. Uh, he is a world-class ship researcher, uh, based in South Korea. So uh, he did a study in 1993 on uh, the seaworthiness of, of the vessel. And these are some of the things that he found. 
Uh, Dr. Hong's team compared 12 hulls of different proportions to discover which design was the most practical. No hull design was found to be to significantly outperform the 4,300-year-old biblical design. Remember, this was written 4,300 years ago. In fact, the ark's careful balance is easily lost if the proportions are modified, rendering the vessel either unstable, prone to fracture, or dangerously uncomfortable. So what he's saying there is that these uh, measurements are so precise that if you tinker with it just a little bit, it's not going to uh, it's it's not going to sustain the ability to go through a flood or great storms and and, and you know in, in inclement weather of, of great proportions. The research team found that the proportions of Noah's Ark carefully balanced the conflicting demands of stability, the resistance to capsizing. Uh, in fact, the Ark has the same proportions today as a modern cargo ship. So think of that. Think of the size of a cargo ship and, and how that needs to be able to um, stay afloat and, and to move and, and to transport through water. And yet that same proportions that a cargo ship would use is exactly the same proportions that Genesis 6 had that the Lord gave to Moses. And that's just another astonishing fact that you can't get around. This study also confirmed the ark could handle waves as high as 100 feet. Dr. Hong is now the general uh, director general of the facility and claims life came from the sea. So in other words, he, he ascribes to the uh, to the science of evolution. To a, he's a believer in evolution. So this is not the, the, the words of a creationist. This is not the words of, uh, of a Christian. This is a, th- these are the words of somebody who just wanted to look at things objectively. And good for him. Uh, and, you know, and I pray for him that, that that should witness to him the fact that this was written so long ago in these proportions uh, uh, or, or maintain or or proven to be scientifically um, stable. I give you an image uh, on the right uh, comparing the size of the ark to the Santa Maria, the Wyoming, the Titanic, and the Queen Mary. Roughly, uh, it's a little bit, I guess, maybe a little bit half the, more than half the size of the Titanic. Um, and if you look at the top right in terms of the balancing stability and in terms of strength, stability, and comfort, it falls right in the middle. So again, you know, here, here's a guy who's, and his research team, it's not only him, it's his research team. He approaches this objectively and he says, you know what, this measures up, this passes the smell test. And then I just wanted to switch gears for a minute to something else that I found very interesting. There are hundreds of ancient global, uh, I'm sorry, ancient accounts uh, cultural accounts uh, written far outside of the Bible that bear up the flood. They talk about a global flood. Um, uh, Dr. John Morris uh, analyzed all different stories uh, around the world. These are accounts that are not found in the Bible. There are more than 300 stories or accounts of a great flood from around the world, including large numbers of cultures and religions. The oldest known story is found on a tablet from 1700 B.C. This is hundreds of years before Genesis was written. Remember, Moses is the author of Genesis. So this tablet talks about the flood before Moses wrote about it. So, you know, I'm I'm sorry. I I just find that astounding. Uh, you know, for any of the naysayers, if you will. So there are also similar flood stories from Samaria in, in Iraq, which is one of the known, uh, earliest known civilizations. Now, here's some other interesting things. Uh, Dr. Morris analyzed over 200 stories, finding these common features. 88% said it involved, a, involved one righteous family. 95% said that it was a worldwide flood. indicate God sent this flood to judge the wickedness of men. 66% believe a righteous family was forewarned by God. 70% of people uh, survived in a boat they built. 67% uh, people survived with animals that they bought on the boat. And 57% believe the boat landed on a high mountain, which they descended and populated the whole earth. And and I hope to get into that uh, sometime down the road. Uh, I, it's just some fascinating information. But so here you've got all of these different global accounts, nothing to do with the Bible. These are things that were passed on over the generations and from the history books to 
to families passing it on, to cultures passing it on. And and over 50%, every one of these statistics that I mentioned are over 50%. And, and people who never met each other, never saw each other, never knew each other, thousands of years apart from one another, but yet the consistency about the flood has been delivered time and time again. The other, one last thing I just want to touch on, uh, the earliest Chinese language was expressed with characters that depict their meaning. Such a story is called a pictogram. Today, 4% of the language is still defined in Chinese this way, but if you were to say the word boat, uh, they put the uh, the images of a, a vessel, eight, and people. So, in other words, to them, this large vessel consists of eight people, and that is what the pictogram would be drawn in Chinese today. Today, same thing as, as this vessel with eight people. So, here you have, you know, what, and, and I'm just giving you a taste. Trust me, there's so much more evidence out there about the flood. So, the flood did happen. That, that You know, that's my point. That's what I wanted to bring up. Now I want to get into some of the scripture. First, I'm going to touch on what Jesus said, because this is important to get to where we want to. In Matthew 24, 37 through 39, uh, for as, this is Jesus speaking, for as were the days of Noah, so will be the coming of the son of man. For in those days before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage until the day Noah entered the ark and they were unaware the flood came and swept them, so will be the coming of the Son of Man. So, you know, I think people think, you know, that that's, you know, they're just cavorting and sinning and whatnot. But part of it, you know, to me anyway, is that they're carrying on as, you know, they're going forward as if nothing is is, is imminent, nothing is, no danger is happening, no, nothing is coming that they should be concerned about, and boom, the flood came. Um, even though if you were in that, that area, you would have been around for many years where Noah was building the ark. So, you know, so it is that that will be the coming of the Son of Man. So what I wanted to also, I don't know, harp on is the right word, but bring out, for as in were the days of Noah, because we're going to talk about, well, what were the days of Noah too, uh, that we can relate to, because this is where the, 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 the coming of the Son of Man is. So, you know, we just completed a, stu- uh, a study, a vast, deep, vast study on the coming of the, the second coming of Jesus, the coming of the Son of Man, and what are the signs that we went through so much of that, and hear what Jesus is saying, but similar, um, that, that you'll have these signs, but also people were going on about their lives, not even focusing on what, to me, what is really important. So Genesis 1 through 6 <clears throat> When man began to multiply, I'm sorry, and I did mention Luke 17 here. It's saying pretty much the same thing as Matthew's account. When man began to multiply on the face of the on the face of the land, and daughters were born to them, the sons of God saw that the daughters of man were attractive, and they took as their wives as they chose. We're going to get into who were the sons of God. I'm just going to cut to the chase on this and say the sons of God were the fallen angels. We know that Lucifer fell out of heaven uh, and, and there was a third of the angels that would, not fell out, was thrown out of heaven and, and a third of the angels went with him and these sons of God uh, saw that the, da- that the women uh, and, and the daughters of, of, of men were beautiful and they took them as their wives and basically... They raped and had intercourse with them. Uh, and, and so anyway, I'm going to jump down to verse 4 here. The Nephilim, so this is what we're going to begin. Actually, let me go back to verse 3. I apologize. Then the Lord said, My spirit shall not abide in man forever, for he is flesh. His days shall be 120 years. So he's putting the timetable now where if you go to the earlier accounts, and, and we're going to look at this in terms of the age of Adam and, and the generations that uh, went on after him, you know, hundreds and you know, close to a thousand years old. But God's put a cutoff point here because of sin, and, and he said it's 120 years. Verse 4, the Nephilim were on the earth in those days and also afterwards. When the sons of God came into the daughters of men and they bore children to them. So here you have this, uh, I'll call them an alien because they're not of this world. They didn't come from this world. Uh, These these are fallen angels. These are Satan's cohorts. 
and they they had intercourse with women, and these women bore children, and this is what we are going to call the Nephilim, and I'll break this down. So whenever you hear the expression Nephilim, you can uh, think of, I'm sorry, half man, half fallen angel, uh, half demon is what I what I would classify that as. Uh, so, and I'll, I'll say it, they're freaks. You know, this is not what the Lord intended, what, what the Lord created. Uh, Genesis 6, 7 through 8. So the Lord said, I will blot out man whom I have created from the face of the land, man and animals and creeping things and the birds of the heavens. For I am sorry that I made them, but Noah found favor in the eyes of the Lord. So the reason that right there, the reason that uh, the Lord caused the flood was because the Nephilim <clears throat> were inhabiting the earth. Sin was inhabiting the earth. You had these creatures that were going around that were half man or half demon and half man. <clears throat> so I, I, I've cited all of this down to uh, Genesis 6 up, uh, up to verse 19 here. But I wanted to just jump down to the bottom, uh, starting with verse 18. But I will establish my covenant with you, and you shall come into the ark, you, your sons, your wife, and your sons' wives with you, and of every living thing, of all flesh, you shall bring two of every sort into the ark to keep them alive with you. They shall be male and female. So there you have it. There. So when I'm talking about uh, the Genesis 6 flood, this is the account. These are the verses of which I'm concentrating on, uh, Genesis 1 through 19. So I said I wanted to get into the sons of God. Uh, sons of God are, is also translated as Beni ha, ha Elohim. Uh, they are angels or a direct creation of God. I've given you some rec, uh, references here in the Old Testament. Job 1, 6, 2, 1, 38, 7. New Testament, Luke 20, 36. As well as it's talked a lot about in the book of Enoch. And although the book of Enoch is not a scriptural book, uh probably in a couple of broadcasts from now, I'm, I'm going to be referencing that. And I'm going to show you why and how really there, you even have uh, uh, New Testament uh, um, writers who relied upon the uh, the book of Enoch. And, and um, we'll, we'll be approaching that down the road. But my point is, sons of God can be referenced in Old Testament, New Testament, as well as the book of Enoch, giving you some examples of what I just pointed out here. Job 1.6, now there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, Lord, and Satan also came among them. Job 2.1, again, there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan also among them to present himself before the Lord. So they were able to, um, basically, you know, the Lord allows Satan and some of his uh, cohorts to come with him, these sons of God, these fallen angels, and uh, he allowed him uh, a time to make his case, you know, and, and, and we know, if you read the book of Job, you'll know what I'm talking about. 38, 6 through 7, on what were its bases sunk, or who laid its cornerstone, when the morning stars sang together, and all the sons of God shouted for joy. So this is at creation, this is before uh, man was was formed in the image of God. This is when the morning star sang, and 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 Satan is referred to as the morning star. So there you have the, this uh, this reference to sons of God. But Adam was also a son of God, and but his descendants were sons of Adam because of sin. So who were the sons of God? They are angels. Uh, they are Christians who are uh, 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 you know who have come to accept Jesus Christ. If you are a follower or a disciple of Jesus, you are a son of God. You are, you are born into the lineage. Uh, you are adopted in, into the family of God. So I've, I've gone through this. I've gone through some, some question marks for you know, people to think about. Uh, but I just wanted to you know, stay on the fact or enforce the fact that sons of God are angels and sons of God are also Christians. Uh, if so, again, if you are a follower of Jesus, you are a son of God. 
Throughout the Bible, angels, the Messiah, Adam, and born-again believers are called the sons of God. Matthew 22, verse 30, For in the resurrection they neither marry nor are given in marriage, but are like angels in heaven. So that's for you. If you're listening, if you're a son of God, uh, he, he's telling you that in the, re- in the resurrection you will not marry or given in marriage, but you become like, like an angel. So the flood occurred in 2348 BC, and and I'll be able to show you that in a minute why I'm saying that, but I wanted to just point that out, and we know that. Uh, I wanted to break down the meaning of the word Nephilim, uh, as I said before. The word Nephilim means fallen ones. Uh, Jewish scholars in 250 BC translated the Old Testament into Greek, and they used the word gigantes, which means titans. Uh, I, I have a lot of uh, good Spanish friends and family members, and they would use the word gigantes. Uh, it means giant. It means strong. It means dominant. Um, this implies that they were part God and higher being. They were also part human and half-breeds, like the titans in Greek mythology. Uh, we, we will get to that at some point. Uh, but if you think of Greek mythology and, you know, you think of Apollos and, and uh, you know, the, the uh, half man, half animal and, and a lot of that, I believe a lot of that were things or images that people saw over time in history that that didn't just pop up in somebody's imagination and they start writing books. Uh, the scholars picked a term that the Greeks would readily understand. So the Greeks would know this because the Greeks were very... Uh, familiar with this. And just if you think of Greece, you you, you think of the proximity to Israel in the Middle East, and and it's not that far. So the Nephilim are mutant children uh, from the sons of God and the daughters of men. And and that's, you know, I'm I'm sorry, that's the best way I can put it. And that's, and I'll stand by that. They are mutants. Uh, and, And I've kind of cited uh, the Genesis scriptures that we read here uh, earlier in Genesis 6, 4, and 3. So uh, there is a clear distinction between sons of God and daughters of men and Nephilim. Sons of God are the angels. The daughters of men are just that. And the Nephilim are the offspring from these two, meaning the sons of God or the fallen angels and the daughters of men. The implication is these sons of God are created spirit beings and they had intercourse with ordinary women and produced offspring. But this is no ordinary offspring. So if you think of this, uh, you, you know, you, you, you think about, you know, these angels, these, these beings from, an, from another dimension, uh, and then they enter into the earth and then they have uh, sexual intercourse with, with women. So the fallen angels and offspring are the sons of God, are sons of God, gods of the daughters of humans. So Nephilim means the fallen ones, fallen spirit men and their offspring. The root word for this is nephal. It means to be cast down, to fall away, desert, fail, reject. Uh, Hagibibinim, I'm sure I didn't pronounce that right, but I did my best. The mighty ones, when translated into Greek, they use the word gigantes, which I talked about, comes from the word gigas, which means earthborn. So the Nephilim were on the earth in those days. And then I did want to point out, and also afterward, because that that becomes a very big point uh, that the Nephilim were on the earth before the flood. And we'll see that the Nephilim were on the earth after the flood. And we, we see that throughout the Old Testament. So let me break down the genealogy uh, from Adam to Noah and how we came about that that timeline. So we know that Adam was uh, 930 years old, and then you see uh, the the different, if you're following me, I apologize. If you're following me uh, on video, I'm showing you the the, uh, generations that came after him from Seth to Enosh to Canaan to Mahalal to Jared, Enoch. Methuselah, Lamech, and then eventually to Noah. And Noah was 950 years old. We know that Noah, according to the Bible, was 600 years old at the time of the flood. So if you take the 1,100 years before that and you add Noah's uh, 600 years, you get 1,700 years be, 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 that started with creation to the time of, the, uh, of, of leading up to the flood. That is called the Antediluvian period. So this period from Adam to the flood is called the Antediluvian period. 
I'm saying this because we're going to break down in another broadcast about exactly what happened and what what went what transpired during that that period. I'm also showing you the the breakdown uh, because, as I mentioned in the beginning, it's about the bloodline, and we're going to to see where that what what I mean by that because ultimately this is uh, I'll just say it right now. Satan, uh, the 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 mission that getting into uh, the the daughters of men and having the offspring is about destroying the bloodline to Jesus Christ, uh, um, and th- this is what it's about. And I'm going to show you this in the next slide why, and, and we see consistently throughout uh, the Bible that 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 Satan is always trying to destroy the bloodline before Jesus, the Son of God, is born. Uh, so anyway, I give you the the bloodline starting from. Cain and Abel, we know that Abel was, was slain by his brother and that his bloodline stops at Jubal. Uh, and then on the right-hand side, it, you go from Adam to Seth to eventually landing at Noah and then Japheth, Shem, and Ham, his three sons, uh, their mother, and then the three wives constitute the eight people that, that went on to the ark. But this bloodline that I am talking about uh, be going from Adam to Seth to Enos and so forth and on down to Noah, that is the pure bloodline. And you, you'll see that when when the Lord picks Noah, it's because that bloodline has not been tainted, whereas the bloodline of Cain and on, on the left-hand side and, and the ones that, that followed there, that bloodline was tainted. So this is the genealogy that happens from Adam to Noah. And this is how we are able to get those different times that, that, that I talked about. I'm going to show you a little bit of a time now. So this is what I would call the timeline of Jesus' victory over sin and death. Uh, if you are following me on, on video, I'm giving you creation, uh, which was what we believe to be approximately 4,040 BC. So roughly 6,000 years ago. And then that timeline went all the way up to the resurrection of Jesus Christ, because I'm calling that resurrection is the victory over sin and death. Uh, so if, if you're following me here, you, you see on the top, you've got Adam and Eve, and then sin happens. And this is where the Lord pronounces what I say, uh, pronounces the death sentence to uh, Satan. And it says in Genesis 3.15, I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and her offspring. He shall bruise your head and and, uh, you shall bruise his heel. So this is what what I'm calling the death sentence went out at this time. And, you know, I I would say also, you know, when I I mentioned how people, they, they just you know, they. I, I, I think things are minimized to such a point where they don't believe in the flood because of some of the images that I said. And I, I think the same can be true here where, you know, you, you see these things about a snake tempting uh, Eve and the apple and, you know, it's all cute, but people don't take that literally. And I think because subconsciously and intentionally, a lot of these images are, are brought about because the one of Satan's greatest tricks is if if he can get you not to believe, if he can get you that to think that these things didn't happen. And I wanted to just point out for for a second about the serpent and and the snake. This was no ordinary serpent. This was no ordinary snake. And I just wanted to read from you what Ezekiel has to say. Um this is Ezekiel 28. I'm going to look at verse 13. It's not here on the screen. I'm just reading. And it says, Thou hast been in the Garden of Eden. Every precious stone was thy covering, the sardius, topaz, the diamond, the beryl, the onyx, the jasper, the sapphire, the emerald, the carbuncle, and gold. The workmanship of thy tablets and thy pipes was prepared in the day that thou cast what was created. Thou art the anointed cherub that covered that, and I have set thee so. Thou wast upon the holy mountain of God. Thou hast walked up and down in the midst of the stones of fire. Thou was perfect in the ways from the day thou was created till iniquity was found in thee. So here Ezekiel is describing, inspired by the Lord, what Satan was like and you know the, the beauty and the majesty of him in the Garden of Eden. So when he tempted Eve, this was, 
no ordinary snake the way, you know, people w- want to make it out to be. And even though I give you the depiction, uh, you know, in a, in, in a black and white uh, clip art uh, of a foot or, the you know, bruising the, and killing the snake. Uh, but this, again, this, this was a much different situation. And a side note as well for all you women out there. Eve was not even created when when God gave uh, uh, Adam this command about about the tree. So, just that uh, you know that that could be another subject altogether. But you know because everybody wants to blame the woman, uh, especially the men. But Eve was not around when or not created, I should say, when that directive was given. And you can look that up. Um, then I go on. If you're following me left to right. The Nephilim 6-4, this is when they came in. So we know that Noah uh, took about 80 years to build the ark, and we know that the flood came in 2349 BC when Noah was 600 years old, and I gave you the reason why we know that. So if you go 80 years beforehand, it started around 2439 BC, and it was completed roughly 2349 BC. Uh, then you have approximately a year and 10 days plus was the, was the time of the flood. Then you have, uh, so then that would bring you to 2348 BC. Then you have another 436 years to Abraham, 461 years to Moses, 477 years to David. I'm giving you one example right now of, of Goliath. Goliath was a Nephilim. Goliath was a giant. Goliath was one of the uh, the, 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 the demonic spirits that, that uh, inhabited and was created in flesh. So, you know, my point here is we're at 974 BC and they're still dealing with, with giants. You're still dealing with Nephilim. And we're going to show you in the next broadcast my, many, many, many more examples of that and, and how the Old Testament just kind of jumps at it and shows you that. And then... Uh, starting with the birth of Jesus leading up to the resurrection. And I'm just going to point out where on 1 Peter uh, 3, verse 18, excuse me, 18 through 20, for indeed Christ died for sins once and for all, the just and the righteous for the unjust and the unrighteous, so that he might bring us to God, having been put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the spirit, Jesus' spirit, not the Holy Spirit, in which he also went and preached to the spirits now in prison who were once disobedient when the great patience of God was waiting in the days of Noah during the building of the ark in which a few, that is eight persons, Noah's family, were brought safely through the water. So these fallen angels were were sentenced to uh, um, uh, a, a, a section, the abyss, the Tartarus, uh, and that was their sentence. That's where they are now. That is another location, deep, 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 within the earth. Uh, it is not Sheol, Hades that we know it, um, but it's another section, but where Jesus, upon the resurrection, in those three days, he went to Sheol and Hades, and he also went to Tartarus and and went to see these fallen angels. So the uh, I'm showing you here the antediluvian period is that 1,700 years that I mentioned. During this period, sin and evil became so pervasive that the Lord decided to destroy all men and every living creature from the earth. That's how bad it got. And this is what I want to dig into. These are some of the things, and we're going to go more and more uh, deeply as time goes on over the next couple of broadcasts, because I believe this is so, so very important that it it ties directly into what what we're seeing today, because um, Satan, you'll see in his devices and the things that he's trying to do with the bloodline, I believe that we are seeing this in this modern day age and, and we'll eventually get to that. Uh, you know, it's, it's just a different look. It's the same tactics, a different look. So the plan of Satan is to genetically modify the DNA of man so that the line of the Messiah would be polluted. And, and we showed you that breakdown before to Noah. And then if you, you go to from Noah up to Jesus, and, and we will get to that point where that bloodline was not tainted, even though Satan did his best to offset it. Uh, This plan, if successful, would have prevented the Messiah from coming and thus prevent the punishment of Satan and the fallen angels. How does he do this? By mixing his seed with man, thereby changing his DNA. 
So if you think about a, this 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 uh, alien that's coming from this other world has not have the DNA of man. So if you, it, it's basically it's creating the Nephilim that has a different DNA image of man of 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 what God created. So he's trying to destroy the DNA. He's trying to destroy the lineage and the heritage up to the Lord Jesus Christ. He's trying to destroy and taint the DNA of man. And I believe ultimately that that's what you're going to see when you get into the seven year tribulation and the mark of the beast. It's going to be about the tainting of of the blood. It won't destroy the bloodline of Jesus but anybody who does take that mark, their bloodline will be tainted and you will, that's it, you're done. Uh, so this is how serious it is. This is how important it is. So Yahweh made, Yahweh being the father, so that is what many would, would call him in, in Hebrew. I'm sorry, it just, I don't want to assume anything. So uh, Yahweh is the, is the name of the father. So Yahweh made man in his image. Satan is trying to make man in his image. Is always presenting a false reflection of Yahweh. He's always trying to mimic God, and I, you know, there's there's countless examples of that throughout the Bible. So here you have that. And then I just want to wind this down. Uh, I'm going to show you some examples of of what we see today uh, regarding the dinosaurs and regarding giants. Um, the Bible indicates there are plenty of giants in ancient Israel and surrounding nations. And we're going to get into that. If you're following me on video, I'm going to show you some things over these next several slides. I'm going to describe it. Many people are familiar with it, uh, or you can look it up if not. Every rabbinical source speaks of living giants. Trusted ancient historians, they wrote about the existence of giants. This is not anything new. Renowned early explorers surveyed North and South America. They wrote in their journals about actually meeting giants. Up until the 1950s, the New York Times and countless other uh, newspapers wrote about discoveries of giant bones, of giants, uh, and, and, and I'm showing you an image in the top right. There's two different images of archaeological digs of these giant skulls and, and bodies that, of the bones. This was presented consistently in the 20th century uh, up until the uh, 1950s. And the reason that it stopped was because then this is what throws off evolution. So according to modern anthropologists and other scientists, there were never any giants because man evolved from smaller matter to larger matter, smaller beings to larger beings, admitting if giants roam the earth, it does not fit the evolutionary theory. So in other words, you know, you go from small to large and then you go back to, to small. It doesn't work. So they needed to squelch this information. It's kind of like fake news. Uh, sorry, I just had to go there. But at any rate, uh, consider the additional evidence that we see today. What about the vast and unfathomable number of megalithic structures throughout the world? And this is what I'm going to show you a few slides on and we'll close. Megalith, megalith literally means giant stone. In the ancient cultures of the past, there are hundreds of sites with megalithic stone circles, walls, structures that date back thousands of years. Uh, the stonework is so massive and precise that even the use of sophisticated modern technology, we can't even replicate it today. So, and, and you'll see that, well, I, I, I'll show you, but the methods suggested by conventional archaeology that enabled the ancients to remove the gigantic blocks of stone uh, in place and more often were miles away from the quarry, uh, simply attempts to, to make kind of sense of these giant archaeologic architectural structures. Ugh. Were these the stone cutters, Neolithic Stone Age cavemen or use primitive tools? It, no, they, they, they can't. So I'm going to give you some other examples. I'm showing you some dinosaur examples here uh, because there are countless examples of man with dinosaurs. And again, it doesn't fit the evolutionary narrative. If, if you're looking in the lower left, I show you a, a fossil that was discovered, I believe, in Texas. I, I can't swear to it. I believe it was near Roseland, Texas. Um, it's a human footprint right alongside a dinosaur footprint. Below that is a, um, a, a, car, a, a carving that was found in the jungles of Vietnam. It dates back approximately 1,100 years ago. 
and it, it looks like it, it is a dinosaur. I mean, it's a carving. It's a man carved this dinosaur 1,100 years ago. It looks like what we would call a stegosaurus. Uh, it's, it's got the, uh, the diamond shapes on, on its hump going down through its tail. So this is 1,100 years ago, well before uh, any, any type of photography manipul or before a camera. Uh, so you didn't have Photoshop. You couldn't... You couldn't um, uh, alter this or edit this. This is so. This is obviously man saw this dinosaur, and and carved it and made this image. And again, there's so many. There's hundreds, if not thousands, of examples of this around the world. Then I want to jump to some of the other things that I'm going to show you in the next few slides. Uh, there's something that's right in the. Uh, why do I forget the name? Right below in Israel, uh, the Golan Heights. I'm sorry. It's called Gigal Rephaim, the circle of the Rephaim giants. So it consists of five concentric stone rings with a diameter of more than 500 feet. It consists of more than 40,000 stones, totaling 37,500 metric tons. And I'm giving you the, an, an image here, and you see the circle and the bottom left, and it's a cow. That's how tiny the cow is comparison to this. And it's, it's amazing that so many people in Israel don't know about this, and it's hard to get to. It's not, um, it's not a tourist attraction, but it's in there. It's in the Golan Heights. You can look it up, and then I give you an aerial view of just how detailed and specific this is, and I'm going to show you some other things to, to think about as I wind this down. There are My point here is there are so many things that defy any type of human logic that there had to be these, these giants uh, um, in the past that, that you can't get around. And again, they won't, or they being uh, traditional educational universities, professors, they don't want to talk about this. A lot of them don't, I should say, not all of them, uh, because it gets, basically it, it, it bears out that we are created, that we were made in the image of God, that we were created by a, a, a living, kind, and beautiful, and wonderful Lord. Uh, so I'll get off my, my preacher's stool for a second and go back to the skulls. If you see this now, you're following me on video, I'm just showing you these many different archaeological discoveries of giants that, you know, 10, 15, 20, 25, 30 feet high. There's so many different examples of this, and these are archaeological discoveries. I'm showing you a carving in a mountain uh, of, of a man or uh, what looks like the, uh, the face of, of something, could be a demon, and, and just how high you would have had to have been, how tall you would have had to have been in order to carve that. So some other examples that, if you know, again, so many people know about this, but there, there are these giant, beautifully archaeologically or architecturally, I should say, uh, detailed um, uh, villages, towns that, that are in the mountainsides of, of uh, the Incas, the Peru, uh, Bolivia, uh, and, and we know a lot about these. And if you look these up, I'm giving you some things that you can easily look up if you're not familiar with. Uh, here on the top left, uh, Puma Punca in Bolivia. The, this is a uh, uh, images that are 25 feet high, 100 tons. They are so cut and so polished that there's actually metal clamps that are in there that are holding them together. So they, they were able to get these metals and they clamped them and they put them together. And not only that, they're artistically decorated. So think about, you know, you're, you're manipulating stone, a hundred tons, 25 feet high. How is that possible? Look at some of the images I'm, I'm presenting here. Then there's uh, the, an image of Queen Neferidi. Uh And there's so many, if you look at the Egyptian uh, discoveries, fancy headdress or elongated skull is what I would say. Because if you look at a lot of the ancient uh, um, drawings, and, and particularly in Egypt, you see a lot of these elongated skulls, that, that they're not how man would be. They're, they're, they're distinctly different. And um, when you see images drawn of man or carvings of man in, in Egypt like this, they're so much smaller than the actual giants that are with them. I'm pointing here a fossil museum uh, with a, a, a leg bone or a thigh bone that, that of a giant that they found. The guy gives you an, an, an idea that this is a typical man, let's, say, let's call him five foot eight, I don't know. 
but he could easily walk under the legs of a man this size. And then I point out other things here with uh, animals and man, because you'll, you'll, you'll see a lot of that as, as time goes by. Just some other things. I'm winding down. Uh, the pyramids are something that, that just absolutely sticks out. Everybody in the world is familiar with the pyramids. The foundation is laid with such precision through the cutting and the laying of, block, of blocks and the lifting and the setting that each one with the precise alignment lines up exactly with the sun, the moon, and the stars. You can go in there and you can base your compass on it. It is that precise. How does... How does mankind do that? How can an ordinary man thousands of years ago be able to do that with such detailed uh, precision? There is only two hundredths of an inch spacing between these 100 stone uh, um, buildings. That's how precise, that's how detailed with such enormous weight it's it, you know it, it defies anything that you say that man could make on his own. There's the Colossi of Mimon, which is also uh, in, in in near Egypt. Uh, it, it's carved from a single block of stone weighing one thousand tons. Uh, top right, the Las Bolas Grandes, Grandes in Costa Rica. They're giant balls. There are there is over a thousand of them in these different fields. Some of them are over sixteen tons, ten feet high. Easter Island, everybody's familiar with the images on Easter Island, these giant male-type faces that are 13 feet high, 14 tons each. Uh, Stonehenge, everybody's familiar with Stonehenge, 40 to 50 ton megaliths with pins and sockets in place to keep the crossbars uh, holding. So again, this cannot be created by man, and yet you... You know, we're somehow to gloss over the fact that, ooh, how, how were these things made? How were they created? Uh, and then, you know, last, I'm just giving you some more images of, of, of some of the, uh, thing, the, the arts, in, uh, the carvings in, in, in Egypt, the Sphinx. Uh, I give you the, you know, the circle of the Raphaim giants again. There's this, something called the megalith uh, stone jugs of Laos. There's thousands of these jugs uh, that are in these fields in Laos. They're 10 feet high, and some of them are as, weigh as many as 30,000 pounds. So again, just, you know, all of these things that were built all around the world, all different cultures, all outside of the Bible, had to come from something that was not of this world. And I would contend to you that the Nephilim had a big, big hand in this. So this is just something to think about. Uh, we're, we're going to continue this on the next broadcast. I wanted to whet your appetite and and hopefully, you know, cause you to think and, and look around. And, and again, these are things that, that we're all familiar with, that we've all seen before. And clearly it points to the, the, the uh, viability of the Word of God. So as always, I just want to thank you for your time. Any questions, comments, always welcome. Please email me, russicoutlook at gmail.com. Until the next time, I really appreciate it. Uh, Again, if you could hit the like or subscribe, be be awesome. Uh, You've been listening to the Russick Outlook. My name is Mark Russick. As always, just my opinion.